If you want to succeed in funds, family offices, or any deal, you will need some luck, but also some leadership. Join me and my next guest as we chop it up on how to lead, how to get mentors, and why your reputation relationships are the most valuable asset in your possession. All this and more coming right now. Here we go. Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have my dear friend, Joel Friedland. Joel has been involved in nearly 100 industrial property acquisitions and has raised over, get this, $150 million in private capital. But more importantly, Joel's experience and the lessons he's learned provide a one of a kind perspective on both entrepreneurship and debt. So, what this means is that Joel's cash flow first approach is extremely valuable to all of us, as well as to his hundred of high net worth investors. So, Joel, welcome to the show, man. Ryan, it is great to see you. I have to give you a compliment. First of all, I know your community is excellent, and I want to tell you that I have enjoyed a lot of your podcasts, but in particular, uh, there's a Chicago guy that was on by the name of Michael Episcope, who I think is great from Origin Investments. And then you had Adam Coffey. That might have been my favorite interview on any podcast ever. So great job. Thank you. Yeah, Adam was brilliant. Michael is brilliant. And, and you're certainly numbered amongst those greats as well. So we've been very fortunate to be in the top 2% in the world, all because of amazing guests, just like you, Joel. So let's jump right into it. There's a lot of beginners out there uh, right now. And back in the day, that was you. That was me. We were all just this full of, uh, as we say, piss and vinegar in, in Canada. We're just excited and we're ready to take on the world and do all these wonderful things. But sometimes through all of that exuberance, you can make mistakes or you can miss the mark on getting some early points on the board because you're really shooting too high and going for this large ladder. So for the beginners out there, what advice can you give them from all of your experience on how to get some early points on the board? Well, what I did is I found a mentor early on. I was 22. I graduated from the University of Michigan and I found a family in Chicago. Their last name was Podolsky. And I literally cold called them because I knew that they had 84 industrial buildings and I wanted to have a mentor that really did great in real estate. I didn't know what industrial buildings were, but I knew that they had them. So I called up this, this Milt Podowski and I said, Mr. Podowski, I'd like to be in real estate. I'd like to uh, talk to you about coming to see you and coming to work for you. And he happened to be interested in hiring a property manager. He was looking for somebody. He said, well, kid, come on in. So I actually drove to his office that day and I sat down with him and I sat down with his two sons and his daughter. It was a family business. And they told me that, hey, it's 1981, interest rates are 17%. We own 84 buildings and we have a problem, which is 10 are vacant and it's hard to fill them because companies are not growing. They are really scared to death because the economy is so bad. So what would you do to fill up the buildings? And I said, well, I want you guys to be my mentors and I want to show you what I can do. I would literally drive to the industrial parks where your buildings are and I would go door to door, walking in the door of companies where I've never met them before and tell them, hey, I've got a building available for lease a couple doors away. Would you like to consider moving? And Milt, who was just a big personality, looked at me, he says, you're hired. <laughs> and that was it. So the answer is get a mentor. I worked for them for 10 years and they taught me everything, including everything about industrial real estate, which is, I think, an incredible asset class. I'm in it, but I've learned a lot about it. And it's uh, industrials everywhere. And it's always been there. And people are just flocking right now to industrial. I learned from the Podowskis how to be a syndicator. They had brought in many investors into their deals and literally had done half a billion dollars worth at that time of syndication of industrial properties. And I just said to them, you, you've got to real great business here and I want to help you grow it. I didn't say I'm here to learn, but they weren't looking for someone to learn on their dime. They were looking for someone to help them, which reminds me of the Sam Zell story. If you watch, Sam Zell recently passed away. He was a Chicago um, legend, one of the great real estate people of, of all time. And in his podcast and later in life, he gave a lot of credit to having gone into the office the way I went to Podowski. He went to Jay Pritzker from the, from the Pritzker family who owned the, the Hyatt hotel chain. And he went to Pritzker and he said, I'm going to help you. He didn't say, I want you to teach me. He said, I'm going to help you. And in exchange, I'd like you to teach me. It was a bargain. It was a transaction. And Jay Pritzker said, Sam, you're hired. And so you're talking about two sets of billionaires. Sam is a young man who started with nothing. His parents came over from Europe uh, during the Holocaust and he built a business from nothing 
because he started with a great mentor. And so that's the answer. A young person in the business today should figure out what they want to do and figure out who is great at it. And they should go meet that person, walk in their office, don't take no for an answer and just get hired. I love that. So getting early points on the board, essentially your pedigree is your power. So you look at Sam Zell and then he went to Jay Pritzker and right. And so this, this pedigree of these billionaires, I did the very same thing when I started. So as a story goes, many of you have been following the show for a while. know I had a dream to work on wall street and I finally got my first job, got my first offer, Merrill Lynch in 2008, literally the worst year to do it. So it lasted for about five seconds. And so I was heartbroken when that happened. And so I went out and I had to learn and and scrap on the streets to figure this out. And one of the first moments where it turned for me was when I got a mentor and I learned the three principles, or as I call the three disciplines of capital raisers, which is never eat alone, always ask about their story and be generous. And so I did that. I took them out. I bought, I still remember what he ordered and we, Tim Hortons, right? Classic Canadian cuisine. We went out and I learned he was building a 132 megawatt power plant. And I said, holy cow, I just finished grad school. I can build you the best financial model you've ever seen. And I made that, right? I never ate alone. I asked him about his story. I learned about what deals he was working on and I made a generous offer. And just to your point, Joel, and and thank you for bringing that up because this is important. And I love the stories that you told is you don't say, hey man, uh, I just graduated and I need something from you. Literally the worst thing you could say to a billionaire. Yeah, because you know, if if someone comes into me and they say, I want you to teach me because I want to learn. I'm trying to figure out, well, how many years will it take before they go start their own business and compete with me? That's number mm-hmm. one. Yeah. And number two, why, why would I want to hire someone who's going to leave so quickly after, even if they go to somebody else to work, I, I want them to stay with me. I don't want them to learn. I want them to say, I want to come work for you and make it long term and do great things together. That's, that's the right. message. That's the message. That's the message. And so you just offer to help out. And so I had a skill because I wanted to be investment bankers since I was like 12 years old. I had that skill and I generated on building financial models, which is typically what you're hired to do. And so I would take night class. I would do all this stuff. So I had that skill, but the market didn't hit the way that I needed to. Okay, fine. Everything happens the way exactly as it should, I believe. And so here I am in this moment and I said, hey, I've got one, literally one skill, but that skill can help you. And so I built a financial model and I go into his his office, right? Because these guys, they do want help, but you better friggin' follow through, man. And so I did. And guess what? And I won't say the names, but I walk into the office, literally this boardroom, biggest boardroom I've ever seen in my life and filled with the finance emissary of the Saudi crown prince and these billionaires, this family that just sold their oil company for about $21 billion all sitting there. Like I'm in my twenties. There's no way I would have ever been in a room with these guys. Had I not decided to just not eat alone, ask somebody about their story and make a generous offer. And so getting a mentor can literally put you on the fast track. And more importantly, back to the original point, it makes your pedigree, your power. And so you can try and knock out more degrees, more certifications. It's okay. I'm, I am actually a big fan of education. However, there's a point where eventually you're going to need interaction more than education. You're going to need interaction with the right people. And those people, back to my ethos, your reputation, your relationships are the most valuable asset in your possession. And you're building relationships with these folks by doing something generous and helping out, not asking, but giving. My goodness, that accelerated my career more than anything ever, even since then. And today, um, I am a mentor and I have been since I was probably right around 27. It's the long-term relationship that is built from these these positions of mentorship. The Podolsky family, it's very interesting. Steve Podolsky, the son, is still an investor with me 43 years later, even though he works in a different place than I do. He's mostly retired, but he, I don't do any deals without Steve Podowski investing and also chiming in. He, he, he never stopped being my mentor. He always kids around. I taught you everything you know, but I didn't teach you everything I know. I love that. And, you know, so so moving along on this, it's it's one thing to get some early points on the board. So in our case, mentorship or even like you talked about or Sam Zell, that's that would be more apprenticeship. But either way, you really got to get into the orbit of these people who are making things happen. As I like to say, never take advice from someone you wouldn't trade places with. So make sure that you're hitting up people who are on that path that you wanted to do, just like you, Joel. Thank you for watching. If you've made it this far, we must be friends. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and click that notification button. Now, let's get back to the show. But that's not enough to get some some offense. You need some defense. And so we got to make sure that we don't do stupid things that knock us out of the game. You've been doing this for four, over four decades. So what would you say would give people some good uh, beginners, some good defense on just avoiding making dumb mistakes that will wipe them out too soon? What would you say? 
Well, first of all, to this day, I have a group that I call my advisory group. And I, I can tell, and I'm sure you know this too, when, when I put a group of investors together, there's some people who don't read the document. They don't ask a lot of questions. They just say yes, because they trust me. And I've got a lot of those people, but I've got a handful of investors that do ask probing questions and do read the documents. And they are very careful and they ask questions that even I wouldn't think of. They, they like open my mind to questions and I listen to what they say. And it's very interesting. There's one guy who will send me, when I send him a private placement memorandum, he will send me 15 questions and maybe half of them are, are questions where I'm, I'd say, gee, that's really an insightful question. And I better take my time and figure out the answer. And what I do is I put together when I, when I, I do a new deal, we do deal by deal. We don't do funds. So I might raise like $12 million for one deal and we do them all cash, no mortgage. That's our mm-hmm. thing. And I'll get into why we do something as crazy as that. But these folks that go in, we put them, a lot of them, if they want to be on a Zoom call together, where I let everybody listen to everybody else's questions. And these are the smart folks who are sort of educating the ones who don't know what to ask. And that makes us better during our due diligence while we're under contract to buy a property. And very often we will see that a property isn't the right property when we have that group, because as a, as a almost like a classroom. Some of these people are smarter than than I am, which is great. I don't have to be the smartest person in the room. I just have to know them. <laughs> they have to be my partners. And so that's that's the first one is get great advisors. You don't have to necessarily pay them. It doesn't have to be my lawyer. It doesn't have to be my accountant, although I always have them on the calls also because they have technical knowledge. I think that the biggest issue though is how a person makes decisions. And what I have studied my, my dad was a psychologist and my mother was a therapist and my daughter is a therapist. Mental health matters. So I have a scale that I want to talk to you about. This is something you probably haven't heard. I think I kind of came up with it, although maybe I heard it somewhere. People are subject to their moods. You make decisions sometimes based on how good you feel or how bad you feel. When you pick a college, you go to a school, the person who's giving you the tour is a cool person. It's a sunny day. You go to a different school, it's a cloudy day, the person giving you the tour isn't interesting, they're not exciting to you. You pick based on emotion sometimes. And I think it's dangerous to make decisions on emotion and not on the math and on the due diligence. And I think a lot of times people who get in trouble, certainly when I've gotten in trouble and I've made mistakes, in 2008, I owed $70 million in personal guarantees to seven banks. How did I get there? How did that happen? Luckily, we worked our way out of it and now we don't deal with banks. But the, there's, a, there's a scale that I use. If you're making good decisions, I think you're not elevated in your mood and you're not low in your mood. So my scale is one to 10. One is someone who's so depressed that they can't get out of bed. They can't function. Someone who's a 10 is so elevated and so manic that they're going to do the dumbest things for stupid reasons. And you don't want to ever make a decision when you're a 10. So this mental health thing, I believe that there is a healthy range, which is between four on the scale and six. If you're not overly enthusiastic and optimistic and unrealistic, maybe you're at a six. A six I, I, I try to function at about a six because I don't want to be a five. A five is a little bit too low. You know, you, you sort of know when you talk to a person and they're down, it's like, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, they may be at a two or a three. They, they're not in a position to make good decisions. And a person who's even a seven or an eight I would not trust them. So if I hear somebody who's really like manicky and elevated, I'm not investing with them. And I need to be careful if they're advising me not to take their advice. So how do you stay in that range? And the answer is to be very, very self-aware, maybe have a therapist who, who knows you and can advise you when he sees you going up and down. Maybe your wife. My wife says to me sometimes, you know, Joel, you're a little elevated now. You're, you're kind of excited. I know these good things are happening, but you need to slow it down to make your good decisions, right? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. So when I'm listening to my advisors and we're talking, if I'm at a five, I'm going to listen to them and I'm not going to talk over them and try to convince them how right I am. I'm actually going to listen to their advice. And that's how we make our best deals. There was a funny quote from Charlie Munger, who something along the lines that ladies liquor and leverage are the three areas that he sees most funds or investments fail. And while he's saying that funny and those guys joke around, they say funny stuff. But what, what they're really talking about is exactly what you're talking about, Joel, this is tapping into wisdom of 
not only Joel Friedman, but Charlie Munger. So th- those those minds are alike. And what they're saying is that's all symbolic of a risky behavior and b poor judgment. And, you know, poor judgments can be a leading indicator, but hard to spot. And so failed businesses, you might say, oh, we didn't sell enough or we didn't market or we did this bad deal and it went sideways, whatever it is. But really, if you can swim upstream and me being a recovering CFO, we follow the data and really understand what's going on. It's a filthy habit, but sometimes we do it is we really want to understand what was the process? What was the mechanism that was playing out in that moment that led us to that decision? Because we want to learn. It's not a gotcha thing. We just want to get better. And often failed companies, failed projects, losing money is less to do with the deal and more to do with the decision to go ahead or not. And so what Joel's talking about, which I wholeheartedly can back, is your decisions matter. Now, I know I sound like a, maybe your dad or something that says that stuff. You become your decisions. I literally tell my kids that. But the, the point is, is that you can't run your business like a casino. You can't just go around and invest. You need to do your due diligence. You need to understand things. But more importantly, even before all that, you need to manage your state. You need to manage your mental health, what Joe's talking about. And so by managing your mental health, now this is the thing I don't tell a lot of people, but I'll, <laughs> I'm about to, is on our fund, I actually have a therapist. And I said, hey, man, he was a good friend and and everything. And I said, your job is to make sure that we make good decisions, that we do the right thing, no matter what, no matter how hard it is. We were always honest. Not that that's a problem, but you're bringing in partners and it's it's a lot. We got a lot of funds, a lot of investment theses. And so we just said, look, our mental health matters. This is a hard game. And if you can have all the education and be the smartest guy in the room, but if you're at a two or a 10, you're in trouble. Your education is not going to matter because your emotional state is going to trump that. So I absolutely wholeheartedly not only agree, but support everything that you're saying, Joel. So thank you for reminding us that it's important to take care of your health. And the final thing I I will mention, a little bit dark, but that was one of the upsets in where I'm at uh, in Canada. There was a huge fund and one of the head guys ended up taking his life. This is a very serious thing that you're talking about. Not to take it down in the dumps, but we're keeping it real is to say, look, man, it's not worth it. No amount of money. Like, yes, make money, do your thing, kick ass. We like to dominate. We're listening to making billions because we're on that path and we're all about it. But at the end of the day, certain things are not worth putting on the sacrificial altar. And the certain things that are not worth putting on the sacrificial altar are your family, your friends, and your mental health, and your very soul. So make sure that not only do you do good deals, but you do good and you do right by yourself. I I agree with that. Um, We we just recently bought a property in Chicago. We bought three properties, three industrial properties on the Chicago River, 1,200 feet of river frontage. And they're occupied by companies that are in the fruit juice concentrate manufacturing business. And we were under contract. And I did go to my advisory board and I took all of them through the buildings. I took all of them to the site to look at the site, to see the river, to see how we think it's going to be converted one day into condos with a river view, because it's an an area that is rapidly turning into residential and upscale in the city, which the city tends to do. And before we spent $12 million, I wanted to make sure that we were making a great decision. So I do go every other Saturday to see somebody who I, I talk about my marriage, I talk about my kids, I talk about my friendships. And I mostly talk about my business. His name is Joel, which is a funny coincidence. I say, I have to go ask Joel. <laughs> and they say, you have to ask yourself. And I say, Joel, how do you feel before I buy these properties? How do you think I'm doing in terms of my mood level? Am I overexcited about this? Am I pushing it because of something other than the facts and the dollars and the math? Or do you think I'm pretty steady and I, I feel pretty good to you after knowing me for 15 years since 2008 when we went through the tough time? And he tells me, he gives me that answer, and I have to listen to him very carefully. Now, I also have that group of investors that looked at it, and we had all the questions. We did our due diligence. We brought civil engineers. We brought structural engineers. uh, We brought roofers, HVAC contractors. We wanted to make sure we're trying to get ourselves a nice 8% return, cash on cash. We, We hate debt. We like safety. We like staying power. And all those elements were there, and we took our time, and we didn't rush into it. And we read our documents and we were very careful and we bought the deal. And I really attribute a lot of that to this going at the pace of care. It's the pace of care, not the speed of mistake. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very into that. And I preach it to my employees and I watch them carefully to make sure that they don't get too excited about something and say, Joel, this is great. We should do it. Because <laughs> I don't want a person who's at eight telling me I should do something. I want a person who's steady at five and has figured it out 
and has really looked at the facts and figures. I love that. Just to kind of put a final pin in this part, there's something that matters a lot to me, a lot. And one thing I've learned because I've been been through all the the right and wrong in my leadership and my growth through my careers from my early 20s all the way to where I'm at now. And I would say the number one thing, and, and often they're like, oh, he's, he's like a nice guy and he's a great leader. And it's like, it's because I genuinely care. And the reason why, not to toot my own horn, I'm, I'm trying to teach a principle from my story. There's lots of stories. Mine's the only one I know. So, but the point is, is that the reason why I care is because if I'm going to produce the A team as best as I can as a leader, if I'm going to elevate people who come in as a B grade employee and I can turn them into an A or whatever it is, the point is, is that more than anything, what Joel's talking about folks, more than anything, their emotional state matters. And so when you're in my company, I will just constantly walk around and be like, how are you doing? Do you have everything you need to succeed? How can I serve you? And we call it servant leadership. But more importantly, the reason why you do that is to show people that they are supported, that they belong and that they care and that they're cared for. Right. Not in a way that your family does or or, not, or doesn't. But what I'm saying is in this place, if I'm going to have at scale people very competent, enthused at a six, maybe even a seven, we're burning hot. But either way, I need people to make good, not only good financial decisions, but good moral and ethical decisions. And typically, if you're burning too hot or too cold, not likely. And so even if for those of you who are listening, I know we have family office managers, we have people all over the world listening to this really understand. And maybe that's not your style. That's okay. What we're saying is, how are your people doing? How are you doing? It matters. It matters for your business. The mental state of the people in that collective mental state does reflect in those micro and macro decisions that your company makes as a whole. I absolutely love that. We could talk about this. This isn't a psychology podcast. We're talking about making billions. What are we talking about our mental state? Guess what? If you believe the universe is mental, then this is certainly one of those things that you can work on, on your leadership. And just to round us out, Here's my final note on leadership. It's not about getting people to do what you want them to do. It's about getting them to do something they never thought they could. And a lot of that comes from how you can help them to manage their state and their decisions. I absolutely love that. And I could geek out about psychology and leadership and maybe we'll start another podcast on that, but because I don't have anything to do, but uh, in all seriousness, we got a lot to talk about. So leadership, we've covered so many things about your pedigree, being your power and just taking care and good mental health and decision making absolutely matters. But what I'd like to move on to is the market. There's people are making moves, they're making billions. What are you seeing out there right now in the market? As far as you understand, it's not financial advice. I'd just love to hear your opinion on the market. Well, I, I listen to a number of podcasts that are about the economy. And I believe that the economy is heated up and I think it's been too good for too long. And I think that the lag effect from the increase in interest rates has not altogether hit the economy yet. So I think that we're really uh, overly frothy from the, the standpoint of a whole economy. And I can only speak to the industrial real estate business with authority because it's what I've been doing for 43 years. The industrial world is booming because the internet changed the way people buy products. And so when you drive along the highway or the tollway in any city, in any country, there are big industrial buildings that are out there that have been recently built there are hundreds of thousands of square feet, even a million square feet occupied by companies like Amazon and logistics or trucking companies and manufacturing companies. And there's also a lot of manufacturing coming back to, this, to the uh, US, Mexico and Canada from overseas because the supply chain disruption during COVID taught many companies they can't rely on ships coming from someplace else. So industrial is booming. Uh, in my particular part of industrial, we're in, we're in what's called class B infill which is not one of those big buildings way out on the outskirts of town, we don't compete with the owners of those buildings who are primarily pension funds and insurance companies who have billions and billions of dollars. My group will buy buildings that are in the city or that are in the near suburbs, near O'Hare Airport, which is really important. That's a, that's a very critical amenity to be near O'Hare and to be near all of the hotels and the office buildings where corporate headquarters are located and also near restaurants and there are the, the parts of town where there are conventions and things like that. Industrials along the tollway and our stuff is really close in. And I'm very concerned that the big industrial stuff is getting overbuilt. I think that there, there have been millions and millions and millions of square feet built on speculative, uh, on a speculative basis, which is like build it and they will come 
There's no tenant. They just build it. And they've been filling up for a long time. But there's a lot of money being thrown at that. And developers will take the money and build those things, even if the market may not be strong enough to uh, go go into the uh, occupancy level that they're hoping for or retain, maintain the occupancy level that we've seen lately. In our world, we do infill. These are buildings that cannot be replaced. They're smaller. They are leased to entrepreneurial companies and big corporations. And in Chicago, we've got 15,000 industrial buildings and three quarters of them are in the size range that we operate in. And right now we're comfortable with high prices, a little worried. They're very high compared to ever. They're an all time high, but they're not replaceable. Nobody's building these small ones. It costs too much. So I think that the office market, you've seen it. It's a disaster because people work at home and offices are empty everywhere. Retail is trouble. Malls are in trouble. Hotels have been struggling because of occupancy issues and interest rates are very high. So what we do is so different. So I, I can tell you my opinion about the economy, but if you three, talk to three economists, you'll get seven opinions and only one of them will be right about one of his opinions. <laughs> so you, you don't know who to trust. But in our particular case, because I'm scared to death of downturns because I got so badly hurt during four of them in my career, we just do these all cash deals where there's no bank and we can't be foreclosed upon. And very wealthy people who are older, not younger, but older people who are, say, 40 and above, 40, 50, 60, even I've got a 96-year-old partner, they like safety. They are not looking, first of all, they know that I'm not one of these high-flying eight mood people who's trying to sell them something. And secondly, what they like about our deals is with no mortgage, there's cash flow, even if the deal is partially empty, because we don't have to pay the lender, because there is no lender. So that's all I can speak to. And I believe that we're going to hit a downturn even in what we do. So we're being extra careful. And I think that anybody who's out there and believes that Bitcoin is going to go to a, to a, a million and who thinks that industrial real estate that's selling for $100 a square foot is going to go to 200 anytime soon, I think they're wrong. I think that it's overly optimistic for them to be looking at things that way. And we're being super careful. Yeah. All right. So a lot of overbuilding. There's a few things are happening, but industrial, especially in Chicago, sounds like it's still very promising. But uh, other areas, I know we spoke offline a little bit about the small states is a little bit overbuilt, in your opinion. I think I think the small states are a lot overbuilt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, well, that makes sense. So, you know, as we round third base on that and thank you for the, for your analysis on the market, it's always good to hear what pros that are deep in their sector. What are they seeing in that market and give us a pulse on every sector, on every episode that we follow. So thank you for providing us that analysis on the industrial market. So, you know, as, as we, we round third base, uh, I'm just curious if you would have like one or two things, some competitive advantages after over four decades in this industry. I mean, you've been in the game a long time, man. So there's a lot of people that were just praying to God, wishing that they had your background. What would you tell them? What competitive advantages can you leave behind for people that are like, this Joel guy is preaching some common sense. Man, if I could only pick his brain, what would you tell him? There's only one thing. Relationships of trust. That's it. If you have a problem, and I've had plenty of them, who do you call? Who do you call? You call someone who's got the experience and the money to help you solve your problem, and they have to trust you to want to do it. it, it that's the whole thing for me. And in my little corner of the world, which is industrial in Chicago, uh, I've got currently 70 active investors. I can call any of them anytime. They will take my call. They'll know my voice. They don't have to wonder who I am. We know each other. We do the lunches when they go to Florida. If they're snowbirds, we do the dinners down there when I go to Florida in the wintertime. I know their kids. They know my family. It's deep. These are deep, long-term relationships. And I can't think of anything else that's any better than that. I love that. So building relationships, and as I like to say, is your reputation as well. Those two st seem to go like a hand in glove. He's really building those out. And like I always say, those are the most valuable assets in your possession. Your reputation and relationships will take you further than any financial model or any partner or any of that stuff. It can literally knock down almost any door depending on your relationships and reputation. So as I jokingly say, when people ask my advice, they'll say, you think Warren Buffett's knocking on doors? No, people are coming to him. Why? Because he's got the reputation relationships. And so keep building that out. And, and not, it's not just Warren Buffett. It's a lot of people, even in their careers, people you've never with no notoriety. They're just really good at what they do and people around that know it. And so building that out. I absolutely love that. Any other 
piece of advice you'd like to share? Well, <laughs> do a lot of reading. A lot of reading these days, a lot of listening to podcasts, watching podcasts. I think being educated and understanding uh, the macro and the micro is really important. And perhaps the, the number one thing that for me has been my, my uh, watchword is learn about a particular business and stick with it and be the best at it. And there are people who, who are serial entrepreneurs like you are. And there are people, and by the way, listen, you're younger. You, you can do it. At my age, I'm not going to be a serial trier of new things and put everything on the line, right? But I, I think if you if you go into a business and you saturate your 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 team and yourself in the facts, the knowledge in that business, and stick with it, you find the way to be successful one way or, one way or the other by persevering. And so for me, I've really been an extreme player in in that realm, sticking with industrial real estate in Chicago, in Phil's, you know, B class B. I'm an extreme, but uh, I think that that's for sure for me that the the thing that is so important. I love that. So as we wrap things up, any any way that people can get a hold of you or learn more about what you do, any anything at all, closing remarks. Sure. BrittProperties.com is our website. B-R-I-T with one T, Britt Properties. We named our company, uh, we sold we sold a company years ago. We were we, we had a capital event, um, a liquidity event. And I went and restarted in the same business. I still had a lot of properties, but we started a new company and we needed a name. Our property manager's name was Brad. And I like to make people feel really important when they are. And so we named Brit for Brad. Brad really is terrific. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That's awesome, man. That's a great name. There's there's some definitely thought and, and homage paid in that one. So just to summarize everything that we talked about, find a mentor, work on growing your reputation, your relationships, take care of your mental health, and you do these things and you too will be well on your way in your pursuit of making billions. 